Wow, that was so beautiful. The music has been wonderful. So this Friday, March 8th, is International Women's Day. And March is Women's History Month. And I was actually involved in celebrating the first Women's History Week in Napa schools in the late 1970s. One of my long time, oh. okay. One of my long time passions has been promoting equality for women and girls. So I decided to that this service um, be devoted to women for the Social Justice Sunday. Uh, this topic supports three of our UU principles, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, and the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. So how many of you feel women and men are now treated equally in the United States? In, in, in the world? Uh, the United Nations theme for International Women's Day this year is Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress. I'll, we'll first be reading from a report titled Comprehensive Analysis of Gender Equality Progress, jointly produced by the United Nations Women and the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. So this report is looking at women throughout the world, but it is relevant to this country. This world is failing to achieve gender equality, making it an increasingly distant goal. If current trends continue, more than 340 million women and girls will still live in extreme poverty in 2030, and close to one in four will experience moderate or severe food insecurity. Growing vulnerability brought on by human-induced climate change is likely to worsen this outlook. As many as 236 million more women and girls will be food insecure under a worst case climate scenario. And that isn't even looking at the wars that are happening right now. This report advocates for the United Nations to spend more money on women's programs throughout the world. That's the purpose of their report. So what are the benefits of women's economic empowerment? First, women's empowerment is central to realizing women's rights and gender equality. So they need an economic empowerment to achieve that. When more women work, economies grow. Increasing women's and girls' educational attainment contributes to women's economic empowerment and more inclusive economic growth for all. But for the majority of women, significant gains in education have not translated into better labor market outcomes. So they need to focus more on, on labor as well. Also, women's economic equality is good for business. Companies greatly benefit from increasingly employment and leadership opportunities for women, which is shown to increase organizational effectiveness and growth. Uh, now looking at the world of work for women. Gender differences in laws affect both developing and developed economies with women in all regions. Globally, over 2.7 billion women are legally restricted from having the same choice of jobs as men. Of 189 economies assessed in 2018, 104 still have laws preventing women from working in specific jobs. 59 have no laws on sexual harassment in the workplace, and in 18 husbands can legally prevent their wives from working. Also, women remain less likely to participate in the labor market than men around the world. Labor force participation rate for women aged 25 to 54 is 63% compared to 94% for men. Globally, women are paid less than men. Women earn 77% of what men earn. Women spend more than twice the time on unpaid care and domestic work 
than men. Unpaid care work is essential to the functioning of the economy. Women are still less likely to have access to pensions. So I hadn't thought about. Unemployment benefits. Globally, an estimated nearly 40% of women in wage employment do not have access to this social protection. Women are less likely than men to have access to financial institutions or have a bank account. Women are less likely to be entrepreneurs. Women are constrained from achieving the highest leadership positions. Only 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Lastly, violence and harassment in the world of work affects women regardless of age, location, income, or social status. And regarding sustainable development, almost a third of women's employment globally is in agriculture. Women farmers have significantly less access to control over and ownership of land. So this is, was surprising. Women account for only 12.8% of landholders in the world, agricultural landholders. Women and girls suffer most from the lack of safely managed water and sanitation. Women and girls are responsible for water collection in 80% of households that don't have access on premises. Menstrual hygiene management is difficult in the absence of water, soap, and gender responsive sanitation facilities. Women and girls also are more likely to carry the burden of energy poverty and experience adverse effects of the lack of safe, reliable, affordable, and clean energy. Indoor air pollution caused 4.3 million deaths in 2012, with women accounting for 60% of those deaths. And environmental degradation and climate change have disproportionate impacts on women and children. Globally, women are 14 times more likely than men to die during a disaster. So now, according to Project Down, Drawdown, um, two well-proven proven climate adaptation strategies are girls' education and family planning. It's, it really helps a lot. Investing in girls' education and family planning generates immediate and sustained benefits for girls, women, their families, and communities. Despite the fo foundational role girls' education and family planning play in society and for long-term climate adaptation, uh, only six, the um, attention to these sectors is negligible. Only six Paris Agreement signature countries out of 50 mention reproductive health as a climate adaptation strategy. And family planning receives less policy attention than other developmental sectors. Family planning currently receives less than 1% of international aid. So they're strongly trying to build up, they need to spend more money on women's programs. Countries need to balance short and medium term solutions, such as providing food during cl climate induced droughts with long term solutions, such as boosting girls' education and family planning. Climate action plans should include detailed strategies to boost girls' education and remove barriers to family planning. And I've been listening to, to the idea of cli local climate action plans. I'm not sure how they could get involved, but this is looking at it for, from the world point of view. They should track whether climate adaptation funds are going to girls' education and family planning. So if we want to focus on climate, we have to think about this. Ensuring all people, particularly the, those most vulnerable to climate change and its impact, have full rights and access to education. And modern voluntary contraception contributes to long-term climate adaptation. Uh, a new report by UN Women titled Feminist Climate Justice, a Framework for Action, 
shows how feminism can be a powerful tool to fight climate change. That sounds really good to me. <laughs> the vision for feminist climate justice is a world in which everyone can enjoy the full range of human rights, free from discrimination and flourish on a planet that is healthy and sustainable. The report breaks it down into four R's. First, recognizing women's rights, labor, and knowledge. Policies must recognize that women can offer unique knowledge and expertise, including among indigenous, rural, and young populations that can be used to support effective climate action. Women and girls around the world have been at the forefront of climate activism and have used a variety of methods to protect the environment and push back against damaging extraction projects. And you see them in all these uh, protests. Policies should build on these successes while also recognizing that women shoulder disproportionate care responsibilities, like we've talked about, have fewer economic resources and have lower levels of literacy and access to technology. These inequalities are exasperated by climate change. Governments must ensure that women's and girls' needs and rights are integrated into the policies on disaster response, gender-based violence, food production, economics, social discrimination, and other topics that intersect with the climate crisis. Uh, the next R is redistributing economic resources. Reversing climate change will require moving resources away from extractive and environmental damaging activities and towards those that prioritize care for people and the planet. Policies must ensure that a transition to a green economy aids women's access to employment opportunities, land, education, and technology. For example, school-based food programs not only help to alleviate some of women's unpaid care work by supplying children with nutritious food, but can further support feminist climate policy by sourcing meals from small-scale, environmentally friendly women farmers. Third, re representing women's voices. And we had a great song about that. Uh, women, human rights defenders, feminist groups, and others pushing for a gender responsive approach to climate change must be integrated into environmental policy making at all levels. At present, women are underrepresented in these ministries. Uh, fourth, repairing inequalities and historical injustices. Financial commitments to fight climate change must foca focus on the people and countries most at risk. Responding to the climate crisis will require addressing existing inequalities and historical injustices. That reminds us me of the reparations discussion we had here. One example is the issue of climate debt. The fact that since 1850, countries in the global north have been responsible for 92% of the world's excess emissions. To address that imbalance, the report calls on wealthy countries to meet their commitments to finance climate programs and ensure that funds go to the most vulnerable countries and grassroots women's organizations. Wealthy countries also need to find responses that in for increased levels of gender-based violence and unpaid work and people's displacement from their ancestral lands, resulting in a loss of cultural heritage and knowledge. What comes next? All spaces where climate policies are discussed and implemented, leaders and policymakers must ensure that their responses to environmental challenges also integrate the needs and rights of the world's women and girls. Working with partners, UN Women plans to develop a new tool to monitor gender responsive national climate policies. The recommendations in the Feminist Climate Justice Report are just the first steps toward 
global climate responses that incorporate gender responsive policies. It is essential that feminist goals continue to be integrated into the world's response to climate crisis. Gender equality remains the greatest human rights challenge. Investing in women is a human rights imperative and cornerstone stone for building inclusive society. Progress for women benefits us all. And that's what I really like about it. Let's come together to transform these challenges into opportunities and shape a better future for all. <laughs>